Thank you. Uh, my name is Josephine Kiyoko. I am humbled this morning to even stand before you. I thank uh, the leadership uh, led by our bishop and mom Alice. It is an honor to stand before this altar, the pastoral team and the leadership of this church to bring God's word to you today. And therefore, I uh, just want to take a few minutes to introduce to you my family. If you belong to my family, please stand up. If you belong to my family. All right. And this is Kyoko, who allowed me to use his name. And I can see some Kyoko lets behind. <laughs> we are blessed with three beautiful daughters. Uh, there is blessings there. And Shirley and Brenda must be somewhere around here. Thank you and have your seat. So today, we are going to... Uh, I've titled the sermon, or the, the title of my sermon is A Follower of Jesus. You know, we, I don't know whether you prepared this morning when you are coming. Did you come from the bed and put on your clothes and come here? No, you did not. And therefore, each one of us follows somebody. Yeah? We follow somebody in life. I don't think there's anybody. Even a small child will follow the nanny because that is the person they see and they look after. Social media plus platforms has followers, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And I'm sure you, be, you follow one of them. And the beauty is in this world, there's freedom. You can follow and unfollow them. Yeah? You unfollow them, right? And also you have friends. You have friends. There are friends who, have you ever seen people who everywhere they are, you know someone else will be there because they are associated with them, and especially politicians. You know, when you see this one, you will see this one. So we follow also people physically. Uh, sometimes you are so close to people when they have a function, they just call you, come and take me to this, and then you follow. But why has God put us in this world? He has called us to be his followers. He prepared this journey for me and you. He walked this road where you're walking, he lived the life you're living like myself. But it is not, it is also optional. You can decide to follow Jesus or not to follow him. But I will just put a caveat that it is catastrophic not to follow Jesus. Yeah? And therefore, as we are in this world, we are preparing. We are preparing to go to see and be with Jesus. When Jesus uh, appeared to Magdalene in the book of John, chapter 20, uh, Mary Magdalene, she was there crying at the womb, and when he called her Mary, you know, Jesus knows you by name. She said, Rabon, teacher. And Mary understood God, Jesus' voice. But Jesus told her, don't hold on to me. I have not ascended to, but I'm going up to my father and your father, my God and your God, meaning he had finished the job. So for me and you, the job is finished. And therefore, as we follow Jesus, he has shown us clearly how to follow him. And um, we are going to, so my message is following Jesus. And ask you a question, are you a follower of Jesus? And if you have not made a decision to be a follower of Jesus, then it is the wrong choice, and you might end up in the wrong uh, destination. And therefore, in this world, we are in preparation time. And Jesus is our influencer. Tell your neighbor, Jesus is your influencer. So, see, you follow influencers. He's your influencer. So, from today, everything you do, you consult your influencer. And he calls us to follow him. And uh, he had some 12 men, unschooled men who are just fishermen and other other, other professions, but they turned the world around. You and I can also turn Zimmerman. You can turn your family. You don't have to go and preach the gospel. Where you are is your, even your house, in your workplace, where you work, you can turn it around from, from Jesus. And therefore, if you're not following, and if you're not preparing, Today, this day, I've come to speak to you and tell you that Jesus is calling him and telling you to. And therefore, the people we are going to learn how they followed Jesus and we see what we can be able to learn in this mountain of following Jesus. We are going to learn about Simon Peter. 
And um, if time allows us, we'll look at Joseph and Nicodemus. But if it doesn't allow us, we will just finish where the Lord wants us to. And now we go to John chapter 18, verse 1 to 27, and I would like us to read together. Media, please give us. So let us read. <clears throat> when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the, the brook Cedron. The context of John 18 is um, Jesus had just taken his last supper with his disciples and he had prayed for them. He had prayed for himself because of what he was facing. He had prayed for his disciples and he had prayed for me and you. And now after they finished praying, uh, they crossed over to Kidron uh, Valley with his disciples to the garden. And Jesus, Judas knew the place and he came there with a detachment of... Um, Soldiers and officials from chief priests, Pharisees, they were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. And Jesus, who was all-knowing, I'm just paraphrasing as we wait for the, for the scripture. Jesus, who was all-knowing, he knew what they wanted. He asked them, whom are you looking for? And uh, they said, Jesus, of oh, Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And they fell down. And when they fell down, of course, they fell down and they woke up again. And then Jesus asked them again the same question. Who are you looking for? And they said they are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I have told you it is he. And if it is me you are looking for and I am here, let this man go. That is the disciples. And we are told that this happens so that the scripture may be fulfilled, that none of those you have given me, I, I did not lose any of those you have given me. And Jesus want, did not want the, his disciples to be caught up in the confrontation because Jesus knew the cup that was the journey that was ahead of him. And he was determined because he walked the journey willingly, not grudgingly, but he walked willingly. So Peter removed his sword <clears throat> and cut the ear of one of the servants. And we are called, we're told that he was called Malchus, the high priest's servant. And Jesus condemned him and told him to return back the, the sword because Jesus was ready to, to drink the cup. And therefore the crew arrested Jesus and bowed him and took him to Annas, who was uh, the father-in-law of Caiaphas. So they arrested him like a, a criminal. And you can see the conspiracy here. Why are they taking uh, Jesus to Annas? Annas was not the one in authority, but it is said that he really influenced he influenced um, what was happening, and uh, he was the father-in-law of the of the high priest. And um, Simon Peter and uh, John they followed Jesus to the high priest's courtyard. And uh, John John knew was known to uh, the people in the court, and therefore he went in. But Peter remained remained outside. And then later on, John spoke to the servant girl to let Peter in. And then the servant girl asked Peter uh, if he was a disciple of Jesus. And Peter said, no, I'm not a disciple. It was cold, and the servants and officials were warming themselves around the pyre, and Peter uh, joined them. Okay. Kindly give us from verse 1. It is important to read God's word, because we are told to search for the truth, eh? And every time you'll ever be listening to God's word, take your Bible and confirm for, your, for yourself eh, that it is the truth. So the servant girl, okay, let's read from verse 18. When he had finished praying, oh, okay, let's, let's read together, please. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, uh, knowing all that was going on, happened, happened to him, went out and asked them, Who is it that you? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell on the ground. 
Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let this man go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Peter's first denial, Simon, Peter, and the other disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked her. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and the officials stood around the fire. They were, had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. The high priest questioned Jesus. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in the synagogue or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of his officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer to the high priest, he demanded. <clears throat> if I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him, bound him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Peter's second denial. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man who here Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at the moment, rooster began to crow. Verse 20. Oh, yeah, so that is... Uh, where we are ending our message. So Peter, Peter was following Jesus with the, the, the disciple who they are referring to here is John, who is the, the writer of the message we are looking at. And we see that um, Jesus loved his disciples so much and um, he did not want to hurt them. And that is why when they were arresting him, he said, uh, let them go, because he did not want them to be caught up with the, with the mess. And uh, he was focused on finishing the work God had sent him to, to do. Now, verse 9 says that uh, this happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. They treated Jesus like a criminal. And uh, at, at all this time, Jesus had preached freely. And why hadn't they arrested him earlier? It's because the time had not, had not come. But now the time had come for them to be able to, to arrest him. And therefore we look at this disciple Peter who was the center of, uh, of uh, Jesus' life and later became the rock and the foundation on which the church was built. And Peter was called by God, by Jesus, to be a follower and he used to be a, a fisherman. And Jesus called him and told him, uh, come and you'll be a fisher of men. But when you flash back to the book of uh, Mark, chapter 14, verse 27, uh, because we, are, we were reading from the Gospel of John, but now when you go to the Gospel of Mark, we see Jesus, he had predicted the denial of, of Peter. And from verse 27, this is what uh, he told him. 
He told his disciples, Mark 14, 27, you will fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you in Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus told him, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. And now we proceed to, uh, still in Mark verse 32, at Gethsemane, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus says to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and they began to deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon Peter, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is, is weak. So we see this disciple Peter was very, he was very bold. One of the characters of Jesus, of, of Peter, he was very bold, he was very courageous, he never uh, feared anything. And therefore, that he told Jesus, if you are going to the cross, I will go with you. And what do we see Peter doing at the garden? We see him fighting. And he did not know that uh, Jesus was on his way to finish the purpose of why he came to the cross. And therefore, Jesus, uh, Peter was relying on his flesh, on his confidence. And we are going to look at a few lessons that we can be able to, to learn from Peter. Peter really loved Jesus to the extent that he was ready to die with him. And we have heard him say, even if they fall away, I will, I will not. Um, and then we also come and see uh, in John 6:68 6, verse 69 when the disciples were deserting Jesus that is not the 12 disciples but the disciples that Jesus was talking to he asked the his 12 disciples do you also want to leave and the same Simon Peter responded lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life what have come to believe and to know that you are the holy one of of god so, my question to this morning to you is that the devotedness that Peter had, do you love Jesus to the extent of dying for him? I know we, you, you and I have not gone to the extent of uh, having to, uh, to be in the company of Jesus at the cross, but Jesus is calling us to, to follow him. And we see the good side of Peter that we can learn that he was really sold out for for Jesus, do you genuinely love Jesus to the extent of realizing that he's the only, the only source of eternal life? Peter got this revelation by being a follower of Jesus Christ, and he left his fishing nets to follow Christ. What is it that you love so much that you cannot be able to, to serve your God? You cannot be able to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and your Savior. I am here this morning to tell you that I don't know what is it that you love so much, but imagine at the end of it, it is all useless because this life shall pass away. This, everything we own, the cars, the houses, the titles, the offices, they will come to an end because the, as the earth remains, the, the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening, and time is gone. You can look at your face uh, and, and ask yourself, do you remember when you were a small girl, for those who are old? And you know time does not tell you time is going. Unajiangalia tu, unaona white hair started to grow. Ay, unasianga. Siju unamuka, unasikia mungu inakata kusonga. Unasema, ah, ah, miaka inaenda. So life has gone away, and we are being reminded to go suffering. We are where? We are on our journey. I don't know what you love so much. And um, 
Peter, I mean, Jesus had sin. Peter forgot that we live in a sinful body and in a sinful world. And in a fallen, when Adam at the garden sinned, for us it was done. But God loved us that he sent his only son. And therefore, because we are flesh and blood, we cannot be able to do anything on our on our own. And I want to ask you, have you been working the journey of life without Christ? Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? The word of God says that. You see, at the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were thrown out. And there was a gap. Jesus, God used to come in the evening and call out and say, Rebecca, my daughter, I want us to have fellowship. But after they sinned, there was a gap. And that is the gap that the cross came to, to, to fill. So when that cross was put there, we were reconciled to Christ. And now my only duty and your duty is to cross through that cross. And the person who went to that cross is who? Is Christ. By only believing that he died for you and inviting him to be the driver of your life, you actually have what? Eternal life. And at the end of it, when this life passes over, he will receive you at the gates of heaven. How we look forward. How I look forward. I hope and pray that none of us seated under this roof this morning shall miss that opportunity. And therefore, whatever it is that you love so much, looking at the example of Peter, he left his livelihood. I imagine he had a business. He must have asked himself, when you walk and follow Jesus, he provides. He does what? He provides. We don't see anywhere where Peter and his disciples, they, they starved. Because when they followed Jesus, he provided. So that which you are holding to, give it away to Jesus. And he will be able to take that place and, and leave you. Is it, uh, is it money that you are holding on to? Is it friends? Is it fame? Is it your job? Remember, God loves you so much that you went to the cross that he can take that thing you love away. He can make sure that one day you are in a position where you have no option. Have you ever had a loved one who is in hospital, in ICU, and you go there and you call upon them, you pray, you cry to God, you are helpless. At that moment, it is only God. It is only God who makes uh, the difference. Let me tell you, and the time is now, not tomorrow. A few weeks ago, I said goodbye to Raphael and my children, and I was going to Eldoret. Actually, it's a week. And we, I went to the airport, and I boarded a plane. And I slept. After, after I prayed, I slept. I am wait because I was, it was very early in the morning. And then, you know, when I woke up, when I woke up, the plane was very cold. And I wondered what has happened. So I asked, there was a young man who was seated next to me. And I asked him, I thought the last thing I heard that we are landing. He told me, I'm also wondering, the plane was quiet. You know, at that moment, it was only God. I could not even pick my phone and call Raphael. I could not. I remembered my mother, but I remembered Christ my Savior. The pilot was going up. So after he went up, he, 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 of course, they, they, now they, they are obligated to tell you so that if that is the last day, you prepare yourself to go and see the mech. It is not a joke, my friends. When you wake up, it's not a guarantee. It's by God's mercy. So the captain comes and says... Um, they come, the way they come and say, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we are flying. We have a slight challenge with weather, blah, blah, blah. We are now going back to the air. We will hang on there because we are unable to land because of fog. And I said, my Lord and my Savior, it is only you who knows. And I'm praying that this plane lands safely. So we hang around and you're looking at your clock and it is not moving. Let me tell you, one minute there and you do not know. So we hanged around eh, 15 minutes. This captain is saying nothing. And we don't know where we are. And we are going now. So he said now, okay, we are going to try and land now. Huh? So crew, take your seats for landing. And that time I looked. Okay, I don't know the rest. But me and my, my, my seat men. Tulikuwa kwa dirisha. And we were watching. 
my God and my Savior, you could not see, I could not, we could not see outside. There was fog and it was dark. So tukaulizana, uyu pilot analanda kienda wapi? See, he just goes back to Nairobi. <laughs> he tried. He goes. And let me tell you up there, Ravina vile matatu unasikianga? Turbulence. When there are clouds, the plane is. So we watched, he went, he went. Remember, for those of you who do not know Eldoret Airstrip, it does not have lights, and it's surrounded by forests. Now my thought went, goodness, what if this thing just hits her? Within a few minutes, we saw him go up. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, we are unable to land. We are going back to JKIA. So everybody, people now stopped, started to and we landed in JKIA. And he said, if you want to terminate your journey, please talk to them, to the crew. But of course, um, they said that we are waiting for the, the airspace to tell us. So we were parked there for an hour. And then later on, we, we took off. Why am I sharing? I'm not sharing this to entertain you. I am telling you, be ready. If you have accepted Christ, be ready. It's not a guarantee. Every day you live. You know, sometimes we are so comfortable and we are familiar with Christ. You do not know when you leave this gate what will. So Jesus is calling us to to be ready and to prepare. So like Peter, what you are holding to, God can just take it overnight. Sawa, sawa. Now the other lesson we want to look at, uh, from, uh, learn from Peter, <clears throat> Peter was warming himself with the wrong company. I asked myself, when Peter was going through this and denying Jesus, where was John? John is the one who asked the slave girl to open for, for Peter. And uh, it's like John contributed to the walls of, of Peter. But remember Jesus told him, Jesus was watching. Remember he's being questioned. He was watching who? Peter. And um, he was warming himself there. And I imagine the conversation that was going on there. When I say, Mauna kumbuka kale kamutu kalikuwa kanajita, yes. Sasa ka, imagine kako. Rakali claim yeye ni son of God. Bona si si ajitoa yuko. Si ya mungu aita mungu aita malaika. Why can't God send angels to come and rescue him? But remember Jesus wants on her. So as Peter listened, and it was not one minute, his mind kept on being polluted and polluted and polluted. And he, he just sat there and um, the slave girl asked him, as he was warming himself, Somebody, somebody else asked him, are you not one of the disciples? He said he's not. Finally, he had to, to curse and say, I do not even know this man. I do not know what you are, you are talking uh, about. So he denied Jesus by cursing where he said, I don't know and I don't understand what you are talking about. That is Mark 14, 68. And this is the same man who had seen all the miracles that Jesus had had done. He began to call curses and swear that he did not know the man Jesus. Bad company will start off as an innocent thing. You, you, the friends you choose, the places you choose to be and to associate with, it will start like an innocent thing where you will say, and then what happens? As you go on and on, you get deeper into it. And you know what the, God, the word of God says in Romans? God gave them to their evil. God actually does give, give people up to their desires. And we see Peter, who is one of the, the, the man who had recognized Jesus as a Messiah, is now saying he does not know what. So God is calling us to watch the company we keep, the places that we, we go to. The other thing is that... Um, how we also uh, respond to conversations which we, where we find ourselves. Have you been in a place where people are talking about Jesus or about not even Jesus? They are saying something and you know there's something wrong there, there and you are seated there entertaining the conversation. Let's just assume it's a gossip. 
uh, our office gossip, they are talking about your boss, and you are there, and you are like, you take a seat and say, oh, even now, did you see what he said last time? Umeona leo vile amekuja amevaa nguo. You sit there, and yet Jesus is telling you, you are representing me there. There are things in your house, you see them happening. And you as the authority, you, the fact that you are born again, you carry Jesus, the authority of Jesus. And Jesus is calling you to be there to stand up and say, I guess Peter missed an opportunity. He should have told them who Jesus was and told them, yes, I am a disciple. So what, what would they have done to him? Nothing. God was, and even if he was going to suffer, he was, he had Jesus for, for himself. So it's a caution of, of, that we should be able to stand up and be willing to represent uh, Jesus. We also see that Peter prayed too little. Despite the fact that he had been warned by Jesus, I don't see him anywhere praying in this. In all this, he did not, I did, at least I have searched, I have not seen him praying. At Gethsemane, he fell asleep. He failed to realize that the spirit is willing, but the flesh was was weak, and therefore he cannot make that decision by himself. He should have been able to ask God. Remember, we have no strength of our own. We have no righteousness of our own. Our righteousness is the righteousness of who? And therefore, every day, have you? Are you? Unless you are fasting, can you spend five days without eating? So come, it is. It's true that you can go for five days without reading God's word. Why is it that we have become so familiar with Jesus that for that of us, if you are born again, sometimes we get so familiar with Jesus, ah, nitaomba saingine. And you even start projects, you do things without praying, without giving God the opportunity to be able to take charge and lead. So this morning, everything small we do, God cares about small and and big things, and uh, we are being called to bring everything to, to God. So because Peter did not pray, and he relied on himself, despite even at the Gethsemane, when Jesus told him to watch and pray, that he will fall into, into temptation. And therefore, we cannot make it on our own. We depend on God through prayer and his word. And his word is the truth that he has given us. It is a sword of them. We don't fight with guns. We fight with God's word, which is the sword of the, of the spirit. How much time do you spend sharpening your sword? That is a question only you can be able to answer. Ask God to protect your time and help you to spend quality time in studying his word. Invest time in meditating God's, God's word. Join a cell group. If you do not have, it's also difficult to study alone. You can join a Bible study group. You can join a cell group. You can also decide to get, there are a lot of resources that help you to, to study uh, uh, God's word. And this way, you'll be, you see, when you join every week, you'll be having something to study. So you'll have no option than to. So getting accountability partners to help you in studying what? In studying God's word. And then asking God for protection of your time. This is something that I have always learned that, I am willing to study God's word, but unless I am intentional to tell God, God help me to wake up early so that that one hour I can be able to spend in your word. You can be so busy running up and down that by the time you come back and sit down, you're so tired. The moment you open that Bible, your eyes do what? They shut. So also giving God the best of Best of the time. Let's give God the time when our mind is at best and, 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 and God is able to help us to study his word and grow. Um, and only God's word can change. Yeah? And it is good to serve God. But service can never take the place of your heart. Service can never replace your time with. It's good to serve, but God wants your heart. God wants to transform you. Sometimes you have people in your life you want to change, and then you keep on, on, um, you keep on um, telling them, you know God's word said this and this, encourage them to study there. In the book of John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, you remember the adulterous uh, woman who used to go to fetch water at mid midday? She went, when she encountered Jesus, she went and told them, come and see a man 
who told me everything I had ever. You can't change people. Tell them, come. Invite them to church. Invite them to your cell group. Invite them to your Bible study. And if you have none, call them and form your own with virtual things. And uh, you can actually meet with somebody wherever they are, whether they're in US or. So don't try to change people. Come, invite them so that as they hear God's word, as they study God's word themselves, they will be transformed from, from inside. Uh, <clears throat> The other thing uh, that uh, we, we see about Peter, Peter did, listened very little. He did not listen. Jesus warned Peter, but he did not listen. Uh, he, him, he was ready and prepared in his mind with all his strength and might to fight for Jesus. But had he listened to Jesus, I don't think this would have been the way it, it, it went. And the same thing is with us today. Yeah? He, he was warned by Jesus that he would be deny him three times. And when the cock crowed, he remembered the words of Jesus. And when he remembered, what did he do? He went out and wept bitterly. So, what lesson do we learn from this? And as we read God's word, it's important to Sit somewhere alone and meditate and think about the things that God is speaking us to. And Peter, when he went out and reflected, we see Peter bouncing back. He must have repented. He must have known and taken his lessons to depend on, who? on God. Um, and therefore, how do we meditate on God's word? The world is too busy with nothingness. The world is too busy with nothingness. Give God his space because it's not a waste. The rest is like chasing wind. And this Solomon said very well. Why am I saying um, it's nothingness? As I was preparing this, uh, this sermon, last week I was clearing my office where I work because I'm going to a new... And I saw... I saw, I shared with Raphael, I saw memos, appraisals, many, th you know, you go through the files and see if there's anything you, you leave for your predecessor. And I saw things, and God began to speak to me there and tell me, you see, flashback 2014, 15, that is when I came to that office. These were very important. In fact, there are times you spend sleepless nights trying to develop these things, trying to work, but now they are nothing. Actually, I was preparing them to go and archived and shredded. And I asked myself, what is life all about? What is important? The same thing I'm asking you today. This world is so busy with nothingness. There are things that are, there are things that are important. They are necessary but not important. Because eventually, it, eventually our eternal destination is the only one that will matter. So I still ask you again, how are you preparing for eternity? The rest are part of the process. There are don'ts. No longer Tuesday. In Itangwa, terrific Tuesday. Yeah, pizza for those of you who have children. Ukienda kukula pizza, kununua pizza wana kuongeze, and then they are don'ts. Eh? All those things you're busy doing are called add -ons. There comes a time when add -ons are gone. And they are useless and not necessary for. But the word that you hid in your heart, the person that you encouraged, the person that you are able to bring to the kingdom of God, that is the only thing that. So I call, I, I, I prevail upon you, friends, tonight. Go and sit down and evaluate what occupies your day from morning to evening. And then find there where is my God? Where is it in all this I am preparing for? eternity. Because at the end of the day, eternal things are the only one that will rule us. Then the other thing is that Peter spoke too fast. He just impulsive person. Peter was an impulsive person. When Jesus says, um, I'm going to the cross, he says, I will die with you. I will go with you. He, I think he spoke without, without thinking. And then we see in Mark 14, 29, 
Peter declared, even if all fall, I will not. Yeah? Then Luke 22, 31 to 33. Jesus warned him, Simon Peter, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fall. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. That is Peter for self-confidence, self-reliance. And the world teaches us a lot of these self-things, that self-determination, self... Let me tell you, don't, don't swallow that lie, yeah? That, let, let the world go and tell that to the birds. For us, God's word. Because we do not have the strength, we cannot be able to, to make it. Even if um, there is that part we have to play, we play it by faith. We play it by depending on, we walk the journey with who? With Christ. Think about what, what you say and its consequences. Sometimes it's easy to make vows and ties that you are unable to fulfill. You can be in a meeting and say, we are raising a million, and you say, I'll bring the million. <laughs> Have you prayed about it? Before you make a pledge, you can be in a funeral, and they are, um, it's good to support orphans, and then you say, I'll pay the school fees for the next five years. You have not even looked at your... So it is good when you are making commitments to pray. And that's why I said, let us give everything we take it before the Lord. Pray and tell the Lord, show me how I can be able to support the projects in she, uh, that Deliverance Church is doing. Show me how I can be able to support the orphans that are in my home. Show me how I can be able to support the needy within those who may not have. So when you pray, God is very faithful and is able to show you a away. So whatever, even when you're making anything, do it, what? Prayerfully. And then Peter relied on his own confidence and self-will as opposed to depending on God. The world has a lot to teach. I've said about self-made, self-willed, and we teach our children to have a positive mind, but we have to tell them that positive mind is anchored on who? On Christ, the, the sorry folk flock and we forget that on our own we are not able to to make him god's work can only be done god's way through prayer through holy spirit's guidance through god's word and depending on even small things we see in the book of second kings 6 5 there's somebody who was sharpening an axe and what, what did they say the the axe got into and they went and told her, said it was borrowed. Imagine that small thing is written in the Bible. Why? It, so that it can teach you and me that God cares about small and big. And Jesus' love is unconditional. He does not love us because of who we are or what we have done. In Luke twenty-two thirty-one, 31, Jesus had already prayed for Peter that his faith may not and he has prayed for you. You who has accepted Christ, he has prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. <coughs> so, then there is no condemnation. It doesn't matter where you have been. How far you are? I don't know how far you have fallen. Peter went to his lowest, but God lifted him up. And we, we will see him. Uh, when he was in that state in Luke 22, 61 to 62, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. After the cock crowed the last time, he turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So Jesus has already prayed. If you go back to this chapter, you'll find... He spent a lot of time praying for himself because of what was ahead of him. He prayed for his disciples because they would be in this world and they would face uh, opposition. In, um, in John 16, 33, it says that, uh, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have many troubles, but be of good cheer. I have over. Jesus overcame. And he's looking at you and asking you, where is it that you are living a defeated life and why? And yet, 
after he finished, he said after he had done everything, he said it is finished. After he had taken the drink, he said it is and he bowed, he bowed his head and gave up his so that you and I can be able to live a victoria. So we are going to make Jesus our greatest influencer from today going forward because we shall not live a de defeated what? Defeated life. And then finally, as we finish, we see Jesus prayed for him. In John 21, 15 to 1, we see threefold restoration. Jesus, uh, Peter de de denied Jesus how many times? Three times denial versus three times reso restoration. Eh? Um, in John 21, after Jesus had died, and uh, Peter, Peter had been given a great responsibility, but you lead us, be careful what you say, because you have, he just told his, disciple, uh, his fellow disciples, I'm going fishing. He wanted to go back. He remembered his profession was and she's Jesus Amanda. And the John and the rest, if you read chapter 21 of, they said, we are going with. And they went and they caught. But when they were there, Jesus came and made for them breakfast. What a love. Imagine, you have abandoned the work and you've gone back to where you came from. Kama ni washua litoka siju nyuko nyumbani, nyuko niki nangovu. Ame ito na yesu wa mutumikie na yaya ameenda wapi? Umeambiwa you lead this cell na we una, unataka kuenda kufanya vitu zingini. Lead this ladies group. We unataka kurudi kule fishing uli. Jesus is still looking at you and, and saying kuna breakfast. Come and. And we see when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, son of John. That is John 21, 15, 1. Go and read for yourself because of time. Eh? Simon, Peter, son of John, do you love me more than this? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. The second time he asked them the, the same. And then Jesus told him, shepherd my sheep. Then he asked him the third time, Simon, Peter, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. And we see Peter has been restored by. And from there, when they, when they, when they are meeting somewhere with the uh, disciples and they are given the Holy Spirit, the man became so bold that he went and preached the first message where 3,000 people came to. Christ. It doesn't matter your weaknesses. It doesn't matter where you have been, how far you have fallen. Jesus is calling you this morning and telling you, come, I will restore you. Come, I need you. I don't know where you need restoration. I don't know how far you have been, but this morning Jesus is calling and saying, come, come. Do you love me? Come, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. As Jesus given new lambs to feed, everywhere you are, ministry is around you. To be able to win souls, the greatest commission is to win. And sometimes as we win the souls, we are supposed to rub their, rub their wounds. We don't have time to study about Joseph and uh, Nicodemus because they, they did a lot of work in rubbing the wounds of Jesus. But this morning, God is calling us to ram the wounds. Jesus may not be here, but do you know he has a body of Christ? Jesus' physical body is there, but this is the body of Christ. He's calling us to rub the wounds of the body of Christ. Encourage your sisters. Encourage your brothers. Go out there. Win souls. Stand with those that are if it is serving God and doing God's work, he's calling us to be to be there. And we have not been to the level of being able to touch the dead body of Jesus, wash it from all that. You know, sight of blood is not interesting. You know, those wounds, those thorns, they, mu they must have cleaned them. But um, today, me and you, we have been given a challenge. How are we following Jesus? I don't know where it is. You are warming yourself. 
Where are you warming yourself? And how will you seek God's help to live that warmth? It is better to be in the cold, but in the presence of Jesus. I assumed that when Peter was going through this, I was asking myself, where was John? Maybe if Peter had gone straight ahead and identified himself, he would not be in that compromising position. And that speaks to me and you. There are places we will go. Sometimes it pays to introduce yourself beforehand and say, I am Josephine Kiyoko. I am married and I love Christ. Now, you are able to save yourself a lot of, a lot of uh, things and consequences. So where we go, Jesus is calling us to stand. In which area of your life are you living a defeated life? How will you ask God for help? When Peter was defeated to his lowest, he remembered the words of Jesus and he wept. And Jesus is telling us, I have given you all. I have finished everything. You have my word. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the body of Christ. Why are you living a huh? defeated? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Or is Jesus your influencer? Or how have you stumbled like Peter and denied Jesus if you had already received him? And how may we pray with you this morning as we close our service? Uh, I would like us to just stand and go before the Lord. And uh, as we go before the Lord, just tell God he understands and he knows where you have stumbled, where you have fallen, where you are feeling you are, you are, you might be at your lowest. You are asking yourself, schools are opening soon. Where will the school fees come from? You might be asking yourself, can Jesus really restore me? And this morning he said, come, come, come. He's watching you from the right side of heaven. He has prayed for you. He's interceding for you. And he continues to intercede for you. Just take a minute and go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word this morning. Jehovah God, you have spoken to our hearts, oh God. We bring our heart text, oh God. We bring where we have fallen, where we have denied you, Jehovah God. We come before you, asking you to restore us, Jehovah Father. We speak restoration, speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit. Show us those areas that, Lord, where we are, we, are, we, we, have, we have walked away and depended on ourselves, dependent on our Godfathers, oh God. We repent and ask you that, Lord, from today, be our great influence. Influenza. Be our God, Father Jehovah God. We surrender all to you. You are the almighty God. You are the only one, Jehovah God. You are the only one, mighty Lord. We surrender, Jehovah Father. We surrender, Redeemer, dear Lord. We surrender to you, Jehovah, dear Father and dear God. We worship you, Jehovah God.